What my thought was with this whole thing is we just take time every week. I'm going to go over basic stuff, um, microphones, amplifiers, speakers, how amplifiers work with speakers. Um, we're going to bring the mixer over here that maybe next week we can go get from that the church. from the church. I want to bring all that equipment over here because we don't need it over there anymore. So I'm just going to bring it all over here. Okay. So uh, we'll get all that over here. The TF2? No, not the TF. Oh. The, the older Yamaha. Okay. Um, we'll bring all that over here, but it's just a Q&A, a let's ask about something that happened last week that I did that you want to know more about. Anything like that. I just want it to be an open, like an organized conversation. Obviously, I'm going to have some structure to it. I'm put the crossover in there, too. Because I, I would like to know. Okay, we will have. Look, we'll that. we'll talk about crossover too. Because yeah, we were playing with that at that one church just not too long ago. Um, I think my biggest struggle is mixers. Like I don't know enough about it. So it'll be perfect. You'll know a lot about it when we're done. My goal is to take like that big thirty-two channel mixer, and you know every single thing on it. That's fine. And you will know everything on it when we're done. So okay. we'll spend a lot of time on the mixer. Um, I've never really taught anybody that actually knows anything. <laughs> so just if I say something that's utterly obvious, don't just be like, dude, you XLR cable is. Because I'm very likely to say that. Because I'm normally when I'm teaching them like this is an XLR cable. This is a microphone. <laughs> so um, but anyway, that's what I want is for all of us to just be lifted, everybody learn a little bit more. Typically when I teach these types of things, I learn something more by somebody that, that is telling me an experience or something like that. So um, I tell everybody when I do these classes, I, it, I don't want it to be a lecture. I can't stand up here and just flat out talk. So ask, ask me questions, questions yeah. stop me. Let's go on a side tangent about something else if we need to. You know, I, we don't want to be here all night. I'm thinking, you know, about an hour at a time maybe even less, yeah. however long it takes. Well, I'm not just gonna keep you here to keep you here because there's, there's no need to do yeah. that. Um, if it's just a, a night where we're just kind of tired and we just wanna go, then we'll just go. Uh, so we're gonna make this, you know, not be stressful for anybody as far as what we're talking about. What I'd like to do is go through the entire course. Um, I say the entire course, normally it's 12 weeks. I'll probably truncate this down to like six weeks just because y'all already know a lot of the shit that I'm normally <coughs> teaching. Um, at the end of it, I've got a test that we take, so you can take a test just to make sure that I know that y'all got kind of the information and we're all you know, on the same page. But my goal would be you know, to get you guys up to speed where y'all walk in and look at a digital mixer or analog mixer and you can feel comfortable with doing stuff on it. Okay. The good thing is we have a digital mixer here already. We'll bring over the analog mixer and we can play with both of them and I can show you how something because the thing is, is, and this is what I always tell people in the class, is that if you learn how to just do it on a digital mixer, you don't, you've kind of missed the fundamentals of how the signal flows through a regular analog mixer. Because on a digital mixer, you just touch here. On here, you kind of have to go up and down the channel and do those kind of things. So, anyway, so what I wanted to do, I printed up a couple things. One is just a, uh, a glossary. This is just a I got one. Go old school, just... Glossary. Okay, you back you what I want you to do just in your spare time is go through and look at the things that I have checked in circles. Those are things that I've just checked and circled over the years of teaching the class. Those are things that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about crossovers. We're going to talk about cutoff frequencies. We're going to talk about DI boxes. So these are things that I just kind of want you to familiarize yourself a little bit that when you see it, it's not the first time you've ever heard it. You know, nothing you probably would have sat down and read otherwise. So there it is. So bathroom read or whatever it may be. I got a quick question because yep. it happened today. Uh, we put a D that DI in the ladies' class. Uh, I didn't think we had it in that wrong. I, 
isn't it out of the source into the, the DI, then out of that into, like, we're going to the receiver? Yeah, and those are, D, a DI and a Hummel eliminator are two very I mean, different yeah, things. Yeah, that's right. I they, mean, Hummel eliminator. Right. But they are, they are, DTI. they work the same way. Yeah, the DTI. DTI. But they do work the same way. So the Hummel eliminator comes out of, the signal flow is out of the projector audio, uh -huh. projector audio out, into okay. that. Out of that and into we out, went to the receiver. Yeah, out of that and into so the receiver. So we did do it. Right. We had it right. Yeah, you had you had it right. Okay. Um, so we did it at first, and it kind of confused me. But then he tried the other way and it started humming, and so he put it back the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> put it back the right way. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly okay. What I just used. wanted to make sure I was right because so, I know you told me that before. Yeah, and the Hummel eliminator actually puts a an isolation transformer in there that kind of lifts the ground. Um, so it's a little bit different than the direct box because the direct box, what it does is takes a signal like from a keyboard, a quarter inch signal, and it converts it to an XLR. Okay. And the reason that a direct box is so popular is because normally you walk into a church and you're looking at stage pockets and wall jacks and they all have XLRs on them, they don't have quarter inch. And the reason for that is, is because um, an XLR basically will, is a shielded connection. So you can run a long ways with it. If you run just a, a twin uh, wire line down a through walls and all that kind of stuff, you're going to pick up noise. It basically, becomes an antenna. Mm -hmm. So that's why you run XLRs. Or X, that's why there's only XLRs on the stage typically. So and that's why you get that home from lights and stuff like that with speaker wire running in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it picks up what we call, and you've heard me say it, a 60 cycle hum. So that's what's coming from the 60 hertz that a that electricity works on. So it's considered a 60 cycle hum. Um, matter of fact, we've got one we've got to go address next week. I've got you coming with me on that one, a okay. 60 cycle hum in the system. Basically, all you're going to do, all we're going to do there is try to isolate if it's coming from an input or if it's coming from an output. If it's coming from an input, we can mute the channels <coughs> and turn one on at a time. We'll hear it when it comes on. You hear the hum. That's where you start. And then at that point, you work from there backwards the other direction. Um, before I broke my leg, uh, Gene said that I was going to be going with you to get some training as well. Is that still something I'm able to do at some point? Yeah. Yeah. I just need to consciously put you on the schedule. Okay. Um, and uh, you just yeah. like Gene was saying the other day sometimes if you see him going somewhere, you know, and it's just him, I ask him. That's what I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Jump, jump in the car with me or whatever. That's fine. As long as Gene's okay with it. Um, so anyway, so that's a great that you asked that question. Now we learn more about, uh, so that's the good example of y'all just throw it at me. And if I don't know, I'll make it up. <laughs> if I don't know, we'll find out. Um, but I have, this is just kind of week one. This is what we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to print this up every week. Um, I just found this today and I just thought I'd just print it up. Well, but I'm not doing this every week. Is it? I don't like it that structured. I used to actually have a book that we taught from and all this kind of stuff. It's just too structured. I mean, I like to kind of just go in uh, different directions, but I do have that today. So learn some words. That's the structure for that. And then I have this for y'all to read uh, just before we come back next week. But this is actually going to be everything we're going to be talking about today is in this. Although I, ha I know you haven't had time to read it because I didn't give it to you ahead of time because we're just kind of jumping into the second week almost. Do you have one? Okay, cool. So first things first, the most important thing to learn about sound systems is signal flow. Signal flow. Okay. If you don't know how a sound system works, you can't fix it or it's hard to fix. You go around and around and around trying to fix something. So basically the way I break down the class is we create an outline based on signal flow. And then we take each one of those individual items and then we dive into them. So <clears throat> when we talk about signal flow, let me just write this down here. And this is, let me, let me also say this. This course to me is something that I've put together knowing what you practically run into out in the field. So. Um, things that are going to be real life. The, the reason I'm going to explain this signal flow, and mm -hmm. there's probably somebody in comments or something that will say, "Oh, there's this in between signal flow, and it routes this way, and you can do this, and you can do." This. 
What I'm telling you is just the general signal flow of a sound system, okay? So the first thing that you always have is an input. You can think of that as an input or you can think of it as a microphone. I don't care how you think of it. So, how about source? Source? Yep. Okay, this is always number one. You have to have some sort of source. That source can be tons of different things. It can be a microphone clipped to a saxophone. It can be a guitar. It could be uh, a guitar plugged into a pedal, plugged into another pedal, plugged into another pedal, and then out of that is where it starts your input source. Um, it could be a wireless mic. It can be a CD player. Y'all get the drift, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that it can't be. As long as it's being introduced into the mixer, the sky's the limit. So don't limit yourself to thinking that it's just a microphone. It can be any type of input. Okay? Mm -hmm. That goes into mixer. Okay? So that source plugs into the XLR jack or the quarter inch jack on the mixer. Okay? Equal. Am I right? Three is processing. Okay, and processing can be many different things. Okay. It can be equalizer, it can be a crossover, it can be uh, delays, it can be all these different types of things. So, but basically it comes out of the mixer and into some sort of processing if you need it. It could go straight to an amplifier, but that's where your processing would be. So you, you don't go from microphone to processor and skip over the mixer, mm -hmm. all right? You don't go for processing and plug it into a microphone. Y'all understand the, the, what I'm saying as far as how the signal's flowing. Before, okay, we have input, mixer, processing, amplifier. All right, this is where, how you're gonna power a speaker. You gotta get, gotta power a speaker. Which is? Okay, so you put an amplifier in between. And I'm gonna elaborate on this a little bit more here in just a second. And then you got five, Speaker. Okay. This is the basic <clears throat> way that a sound system works. Obviously, there's they're very different. There's a million different ways to make it work, but this is how you diagnose a, a system. You can also have these things show up in different ways. So, I could have an amplifier or a speaker with an amplifier built in. Right? Yep. Isn't that the, passive or non passive? That speaker? would be active. Oh, active. So that would be an active speaker. So if I plug a speaker into a wall jack and turn it on, you're looking at an, a speaker with an amplifier built in. Does that change signal flow? No. Mm -hmm. No. It just shows up in a different form factor. So now the signal is coming out of the, pro, out of the mixer into the processing, and then it just goes straight to this one speaker with an amplifier built in. You're done, but it's still hitting the amplifier before it's getting to the speaker, right? So mm -hmm. don't confuse the two. Um, I may have a mixer with a processing and amplifier all built in together. Like T5. Is that the ones that have like the reverb, delay, and all that added into the mixer itself, so you can put into different. That sounds? could be part of processing, um, and then the amplifier can be built into it. So if you ever go to like a. Um, uh -huh. If you ever go to like a Mexican restaurant and you see the guys carrying the square box that's they got microphones plugged into, mm -hmm. that's a powered that's a powered mixer. So essentially, you've got just a box like this, you've got microphone inputs on it, and then they just come out straight to passive speakers. Behringer's even got that one two speaker thing that's got the <clears throat> mixer and the amp built into the back of one of the speakers. That's right. Yeah. All right there. Because that's mainly the mixers I've ever used, even working in garage bands and stuff like that. Speakers, uh, mixers like that. Mixers that already that are powered mixers. Yep. Yeah. So this is more of the portable rig. This is the the quick grab it and go type setup. Your limitations are generally they don't have as much power. Uh, you know they may have three four hundred watts something like that on average. And the other limitation is um, the number of channels you usually get on them. So typically they're going to be six to eight channels, something like that. Obviously they can be as small as four, they can be you know up to twelve or whatever. What's the name of that kind of mixer again? This is a powered mixer. Just a powered mixer. Yeah, just like it, just like what you would think it's called. It's mm -hmm. just a powered mixer. So when you see that, 
that all you've got is basically a mixer and an amplifier in one box. Signal flow is still the same. Mm -hmm. That's what's important to remember. Um, you can get a, here's something like this. All right, so this is a powered speaker. That's passive. This is passive. This is a passive speaker. That's a powered speaker. This is a powered speaker. There's an amplifier attached to the back of this, there's a speaker in the front, and there's a mixer up top. That's a complete sound system. So that, that's what you would consider it. That's what, why you can just plug your mic into that's that. That's exactly and, right. And go right that's on. That's why you can plug your mic into it and just go. You can plug your mic, you can plug your music. Or whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. So a passive, passive speakers have the uh, outlet for power in a mixer, right? Uh, no. Passive has no outlet for power. Okay. So this guy right here is just a And that'll be in your... Just a regular old school speaker. That she, that he, okay. that she, that he gave you with the uh, words on it? Mm -hmm. That will be in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this, the, the passive speaker is becoming less and less and more people are going with active speakers. Probably kind of noticed that trend. Yeah. Um, for a couple reasons. One is um, you don't have to worry about how to match up the right power amplifier with the right speaker. Uh, it kind of just works itself out because the amplifier from the factory is already in the speaker. So it's got protection in it, you know. The downfall is you got to run power to those speakers, as opposed to you know just a speaker cable. So um, when we do most of our stuff, as far as system design, what we're doing, um, a lot of times we're going to go with passive speakers because you know they're going to be permanently hung and that kind of thing. And you're not limited to, to power. Right. You can actually run it. I don't mean to. Uh, it's not as portable. Right. Get off base. Did you ever get those wires for that lady up? With those speakers we sent, you know the Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. She got them. She actually came by here and picked them up. Okay. The twin power things. <clears throat> so if I'm going into a situation and um, I have a speaker not working, okay, I know if I see a microphone and I see it coming into the mixer and I see the light going, I feel like that part of the signal flow is a okay, right? Yeah. If I move down past, so I all right, so I've got audio coming into the mixer. Now I need to figure out if it's coming out of the mixer. So then I can go to the mixer and maybe look at whatever processing is in between the amplifier or just look straight at the amplifier. If I know that that's the next thing in the chain and I'm getting signal there, then I'm good. I got to keep going. So now I'm getting signal in my processing and then I go to my amplifier, I'm not getting anything. Do I go back and worry about anything before that? No. Right? You've already checked it. You've already checked it. So you now you know you've got something going on possibly with the amplifier and beyond. That doesn't mean the amplifier is bad. bad. It could be that I have a bad cable coming out of the processing to the amplifier. It doesn't mean that I have a bad amplifier, but it tells me where to start my search at. Went to a church last week, actually, yeah, but late last week. Went to a church last week said they turn on the sound system and it takes three or four times of turning on and off the sound system to get it to work. I said, okay, well that's odd. So go to the, um, before I even did anything, I said, just let's grab a mic and let's head to the amp rack. Okay, oh, well I made sure that it was signal coming into the board. Let me not skip over that. Signal coming into the board, done. I've got a good signal coming in. I can see that I've got my outputs running. I can see output level. Let's go to the amp rack. I'm not wasting any more time here because I can see that. Head to the amp rack. Open up the amp rack. He's got, I see, as I'm talking in the mic, I see lights blinking in there. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm getting signal from there, there to, here. to here. So I'm, I'm done there. Now I'm moving into the rack. So I looked at the rack and I said, where are we getting, where am I seeing the blinking light? Where I was seeing the blinking light was a, um, a assisted listening system. To where like people come in with their hard hard of hearing, so I'm seeing the light blinking. So I'm like, okay, we're getting signal like literally in the rack. We're good there. Next thing that to look at is processing. They had a Bose processor. Remember the one we found the other day? This yeah. is the example that I'm giving you. Okay. So I noticed the Bose processor not getting any signal, and then I look closely, and the LED screen is got some weird stuff on it. Power cycled a couple times, nothing. So my immediate thought is it's got to be the processor, which it did end up being the processor. But to confirm that, 
What would I do to confirm that that was the processor? Would you take the next step to look at the amplifier or look at the connections from the mixer to the processor? So what I did is basically I took the processor out of the equation, I bypassed it, fires right up, everything works, I'm getting signal. It doesn't sound right because I'm missing no, my really processor, processor okay. but what I've done is I've established it's not the speaker, <laughs> I've established that it's not the amplifier, I've established that it's the processor. And you can get there really quick when you understand signal flow. If you didn't really think that process through, you could have went straight to the amp, you may have been out there messing around with speaker cables on the back of the speaker and you're like, I see lights in there, they're blinking, but I don't know why. And so you start heading down these, these paths yeah. that you shouldn't head down. So okay. literally seven minutes, figured it out, ordered the new, or got the new piece. I still got to install it, problem solved. But that's how you get to the solution quick is by understanding signal flow. What is the purpose of processing? What does that really do? So processing is a whole gamut of conversation. Um, so say I've got uh, an EQ in a sound system, mm -hmm. changes to frequencies. So you change the frequencies to make the room sound more natural or to, to take care of some, some things that are happening in the room that maybe it's like adding like some extra low end trap in, in a room and you, you got these weird things happening. Um, that actually is used to help EQ a room. That's one example. Another example would be a crossover. These are things that we're gonna go into more in detail. Okay. Uh, a crossover where I need to tell high frequencies to go one place and I need to tell low frequencies to go another place. Um, that's just a couple examples. Okay. Um, the good thing is nowadays digital consoles do a lot of this for you. Um, analog boards didn't, but that's the, the difference. You know, what and what digital boards did is got rid of a lot of outboard gear. So you got a analog mixer here, you got a rack of compressors and all these different things over here, EQs and all this stuff. You can take all that, squish it, throw it away, put it in your digital board. So, uh, but we'll definitely go more into detail on okay. that. Um, so input microphone, so we're gonna go into each one of these individually. Input uh, microphone is what I wanna talk about today is microphones. I wanna kinda dive a little bit into understanding how microphones work and what they do. Because you had a, um, go ahead. Oh, this is it, okay, no, this is it. I was gonna say you had, a little thing to show with each microphone. <clears throat> so there's two types of microphones that you're going to run into in your world, and that's dynamic and condenser. Dynamic and condenser. Do y'all know which one requires fan of power? Condenser. Condenser. Okay, so a condenser microphone requires 48 volts of fan and power. You're going to find that somewhere on the mixer. Most of y'all already know this, but I'm just telling you anyway. You're going to find that somewhere on the mixer. It could be a switch in the back behind the mixer. It could be a switch on the top. It could be a switch individually per channel on a mixer. Okay? So you really got to look and dive in. If you ever go into a church and choir mics aren't working or the podium mic isn't working or something like that, that's <coughs> the first place you're going. Yeah. Don't even think about doing anything else before you make sure the fan power is turned on. Because what we run into a lot is the fan of power is located behind the mixer. Mm -hmm. They turn the mixer on and off and then they accidentally hit the fan of power. And then you get a phone call, hey, the choir marks aren't working. We think rats chewed the cables or lightning got them or whatever. So that's the, the first thing you go to. Um, dynamic microphones require no fan of power. Okay? So the way these guys work is, and you, you know, I get the question all the time, why, doesn't every, why isn't everything fan and power if it sounds so much better, right? Fan and powered microphone is, has a, a lot more sensitivity to it. So it's great for some situations, it's not great for other situations. So let me back up a little bit. Fan and power doesn't affect a, a dynamic microphone at all, right? Right. Okay, so if I turn on fan and power on the board, I plug in a dynamic mic, it's not gonna damage it, it's not gonna hurt it. It just, it doesn't need it, so it just doesn't use it. use it, okay? So don't worry about it. The way a dynamic mic works is it basically you can think of it almost like the reverse of a speaker, okay? It has a diaphragm in there. When you talk, you're moving the air. 
that's creating an electronic energy that's sent down the line and it sees that as sound. That's the basic quick, and you, don't need, you don't need to know much more than that to do what we're doing, it, it works, right? All right, so that, it works almost like reverse of a speaker, okay? A, a condenser microphone actually uses an electric charge and it, it, um, it uses an electrically charged diaphragm backplate assembly, which forms sound sensitive capacitor. There you go. Back to the future. Just sounds good. <laughs> so they um, condenser microphones. What I want you to know again, I'm just we're into meat and potatoes of this stuff. Where you're going to find it in church? Where you're going to find it in a school? You're going to find it on the podium. Condenser microphone. Okay. Choir. And you're going to find it in the choir. That's the main place you're going to see those. In a school, you're going to find it in like the large diaphragm microphones, like we installed today. Mm -hmm. Those are uh, uh, condenser microphones. Primarily, that's where you're going to find it. Other than otherwise, like in the cafeteria, you may see some choir microphones hanging down and stuff like that too. And sometimes, like the mics we were putting in fine arts. Yes, 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 yes. The mics that we hang up in the fine arts, condenser microphones as well. Yeah, probably a condenser microphone. Probably. Yeah. That one is. So um, that's really, you know, what's the, what's the difference in price? Typically, you get dynamic mics, a really good dynamic mic in that $89 to $110 range, the Shure SM58s, the, yeah. you know, the Sennheiser EA35s, stuff like that. Um, you can buy them as cheap as probably $10, $5, that's probably junk. Um, the condenser microphones are going to be more expensive, so you can just go ahead and plan on spending more if you're getting a condenser microphone. A good large diaphragm condenser microphone you can easily spend you know five hundred to a thousand dollars for. Um, Sony just I think it was Sony, it was Sony uh, just released one. It was like twelve grand. So wow. Um, yes, Newman does. Okay, let me talk about. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. Directionality. This is what a lot of people. Um, don't quite understand with microphones, and this helps a lot um, to understand it in the way that I'm about to tell you about it. Uh, microphones are like flashlights, okay? They're either a narrow type of spotlight, or they're either a wide type of floodlight. And what I mean by that is how they capture the sound, okay? So if you have a microphone like this, this is a unidirectional card, well, we'll just, this is a cardioid microphone. All right, if I have a microphone like this, and I'm talking into this microphone, this has a cardioid, what we call like a heart-shaped pickup pattern, okay? That's where is this microphone picking up? If I take this microphone, and I don't have it set up, but if I was talking into it in the speaker, as I'm, going, as I'm turning it, guess what's happening? It's going away, right? It's creating rejection from this side of the microphone. And that's by design, because you really want the microphone to pick up what it's intended to pick up and not anything else. So if RV's over here singing okay. or well or instruments, organ, uh, yeah. drums, all that kind of stuff, you want to just pick up that source that you're intending to pick up. Um, so that's one reason why you have a directional microphone. The other reason is I need to have rejection from the floor monitor that's on the floor. Okay? Because typically you have a speaker that's on the floor coming back at you. Which we're gonna learn about why those why we have floor monitors and we're gonna learn how to mix them. So we're going to be playing around with all that. Um, when, it, when it's on the floor right there, you really want that rejection on this side of the microphone so it doesn't feed back. Because feedback is, uh, happens when basically the microphone can hear the speaker more than it can hear the source. So think of it that way. That's just an easy way to think of it. Um, so I could be talking in this microphone here and I turn it and I move it here. And now if this microphone is here in that speaker, that's when you get your, your cycle. Okay, I have to look it up, but I did a whole, um, I did a whole um, thing on feedback and, and all the science behind it and all that like years ago. But anyway, the the thing that y'all again we're down to the just the, the what if it matters. Um, if the microphone can see the speaker, it's much more likely to feedback. There's two things that cause feedback the most, and that is. Direct, uh, you know, whether you can see it, think of it as a flashlight. If there's a micro, if there's a speaker there, I pointed at it. Guess what? Much more likely to feedback than not using the rejection 
of having it this way. The other is distance. The more distance you can gain, the better off you are to help eliminate feedback. That's why when we go into a church, we're trying to keep the speakers towards the front of the stage. We're trying to maybe do a cluster that's up high. We're not putting the speakers back here, right? Because we don't want the microphones pointing at the speakers. Okay? So you want to utilize that uh, the uh, rejection that you're getting out of it. So there's a few different types of <coughs> Let me see how they add. Okay, so there's omni, omnidirectional. What would that mean? Picks up all directions. Picks up everywhere. Okay, picks up from all different sides, everywhere around it. Um, would that be good to use on a stage? No. On a stage, pick up the sound everywhere. I would, I would think not. You, yeah, you right. don't want this. Everything coming through all the right. speakers. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get feedback like crazy because then it can see all the speakers. It's going to be picking up everything. Not a great thing. You don't use this much for live situations. Okay. Omnidirectional is a great, you know, set a, a microphone on a conference table. Everybody picks up everybody. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different reasons that you would use it, but typically they're used for um, things where you're recording or you're doing like a, uh, broadcast or something like that, not where you're trying to reinforce in a space. Um, the one exception to that, I will back up a little bit uh, because this may confuse you a little bit. One uh, one thing that you do use an omnidirectional mic for, microphone a lot is the small theater mics that are you know here, the, and um, they will use those because um, if you have movement, if it's a directional mic and it moves a little bit, it changes the frequency response and everything of the, of the person. So if you take a mic here and you move it to here, it sounds completely different. different. Yeah. So in theatrical, because you're moving around a lot and you're doing all these things, typically you have a lot of distance from your speakers. You've got people that actually project, you know? So you can get away with using omnidirectional elements. And so that way, if there is movement, your uh, frequency response remains the same. And a lot of times you see them where I'm here. Sure, so. yeah. Now, there's uh, plenty of applications where uh, you would want to use directional to. So uh, I'm just letting you know you will see them in the you know in headsets. You'll see omnidirectional. Um, but what what I'm referring to is mostly like microphones on a stage. You wouldn't want to use omnidirectional because that's going to get you in trouble. Okay. <clears throat> so cardioid. It's the most popular. Any microphone that you pick up that's like this, there's probably about an 80% chance that it's cardioid. Okay? And that's also known as the undirectional? Uh, no, just cardioid. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, it looks like this. And there's a, a drawing of it right here. It's kind of a heart pattern. So it kind of looks like that. So you're going to get, you're going to get good rejection this way and you're going to pick up this way. That's, the, that's what your the most popular setup is going to be your cardioid element. Okay, and then you have super cardioid. All right, what is super cardioid? Maximum sensitivity yeah, at all degrees, it's, at zero degrees? No, it's, it's, more, it's more narrow. Okay. Yes, it's going, to get, it's going to do what you said it's going to do, but I want you to think of it as more narrow. So what it does is basically it tightens up that pattern that it's going to pick up, and it gives you more focused rejection here. Uh, would you want to use a super cardioid element with somebody that doesn't know how to use a microphone? No, because if they move it, mm -hmm. it's over. So let's talk, let's talk, let's have this meeting today about yeah, blah, 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 blah. Well, they're gone. Yeah. If it's a, another one is a hyper, so it's hyper, super cardio. Anyway, so at this point, they're gone. they got to have it right here. Great microphone to use if you know somebody knows how to, if they know how to use a microphone. Because they're going to have it right here. It's going to reject all that stuff. It's going to sound good, be really sensitive. Good microphone to have. Problem is, most people we're dealing with in our world. Don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. Okay. So... So that's why cardioid is definitely the most popular because it's the most forgiving uh, microphone.
Okay. All right. So those are those are three that you're going to run in, run into the most. That I'm going to erase this. How do you know what a what pickup pattern a microphone is by looking at it? Everybody got this. Yeah. Typically, be able to tell by the uh, screen, uh, the guard, the gauge, cap, whatever you call it. There's no way to tell. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I was about to get confused on that because <laughs> normally I can look and see like that type of microphone we were installing today. I would know right off the bat that's that's a condenser <laughs> mic. And the only reason I would think that's a condenser mic right off the bat is because it's something that I've seen in uh, vocal booths. Mm -hmm. And normally condenser mics are. Do a lot of mics have the cardioid pattern like on a, on the side? Like a lot of them have a little picture of it. A lot of the cheap ones do. The cheap ones. Do? Yeah, like you'll see that. You'll see. Yeah, but a lot, most of them don't. They have a model on it. Uh, this is an E840, so we could we could look that up. You don't you don't know. You have to you have to look at it. So I've been in situations before where, uh, plenty of times, where I go into a church and we're having feedback issues, and I have to go look at the mics and I'm trying to figure out what they're using, and you know I have to Google it or whatever to to see what what it is they're the trying to use, is. and then I'll take and like switch them around because maybe I, you know something that would be good for an overhead on a drum, you know they had on a guitar amp or or whatever. So you kind of go through and and you, know, you just have to look at them unless been doing it forever a lot of these I know what they are just by looking at them but a lot of them I don't too so like I was always using the SM58 dynamic mics and then party, well, yeah. I've got uh, I can't remember what model it was it's still an SM but I think it's like an SM53 or a 56 or something like there's that. there's a SM57 so with that's flat, a flat that's yeah. a um, that's for your um, guitar amp and stuff yeah. like that but this one is I have to bring it in because I still have it but it's a condenser mic and it looks just like a 50 uh, SM58, but it's got a slimmer handle to okay, it. Okay, that's a beta. Beta? That's a beta mic. If it's a condenser, mm -hmm. and it's sure. Because it has to run off the fan of power. Mm -hmm. And it has a slimmer slimmer mm -hmm. kind of shaft on it. Yeah. That's a good mic. It's a real good mic. That might be a beta 87A. Okay, yeah, I got that as a birthday present one time. So yeah, that was like my favorite. spend some money on you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm guessing it's a beta 87. Go home and text me. I'll be curious. Okay. But that, that's a really good mic. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, don't, uh, well, let me say this. <laughs> don't confuse your pickup pattern with condenser and dynamic. That can show up on any condenser or dynamic. Okay? Sometimes. Okay. When I talk about this, they think dynamic can have all these different things, and they forget the condenser can also have all the different pickup patterns. So um, you can look at a, a condenser mic or a dynamic mic, and either one of them could have the same patterns that we just talked about. Okay. I have a mic at the church, which I'll we'll, we'll grab when we come. I have a mic that is a has a variable pickup pattern. Oh. So we can take it from cardioid to omnidirectional and I can demonstrate to you how the pickup pattern works and how the speakers respond to the pickup pattern. So we'll, we'll try to do that did next we week. Ever do that? I don't no. think we did. I don't remember that. But... Yeah, that's the day you skip. Man, I'll do it twice. The shirt mode oh, is the, the next one of those that you can twist it and it tightens it up. Yeah. You twist it the other way and it opens it up. Yeah, that that actually has in that in the software for it it has where it digitally does that pattern as well so if you go in there at some point you'll see that where it, it'll do that um, anyway let's talk about well, okay on time all right let's let's just go into this we'll, we'll be quick um, let's talk about the frequency response of a microphone I won't take too much time on this but you know the question comes up, well, what's the difference between this microphone and this microphone and this microphone and this microphone and all, you know. The big difference of a microphone is the frequency response of the microphone, okay? So if you look at, let me try to, okay. So in terms of how we hear sound in our industry, how we kind of work and do what we do, we work between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, okay? That's where we live. So you got 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz, okay? This is super low frequencies, 
You get over here, we're getting into really high frequencies. Okay? Um, most of your voice, speaking, all that is in mid-range, around 1K. Most of your low frequencies are about 200 and below, going this way. <coughs> most of your high frequencies, this is argu arguable. Everybody, you would probably argue one way or the other that starts different places. But So this would be considered lows, mids, highs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you look at a mixer and you're adjusting the knob on the low, the low one that says low, mm -hmm. guess what, you're boosting this frequency range kind of in here. You're doing mids, you're in this range. You're doing highs, you're in this range. We're, we'll go more into detail on this, but I, I wanted to lay this out because telling you that we work between 20, 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz is great, <laughs> but I want to explain how that relates to microphones. If you look at uh, if you look at these frequency responses, or you see these little charts, okay, that's the frequency response of the microphone. Let me explain. If I had a microphone frequency response, is it this chart right here? <clears throat> no, the next one. If I had a microphone, and I told you this is 20 to 20, if I had a microphone that the frequency response kind of looked like this. What would you say that microphone is doing to your voice? Not much. Flattening it? I would focus think on, it focus focus on it, this. It's it bringing out your lows? It's bringing out your lows. Okay? This is the response of the microphone. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of and this is not the best drawing. I did that really quick. But it's kind of boosting the low frequencies. Okay? If I had a microphone frequency response that kind of looked like this, you bringing out the mids then. It's, okay. it's naturally boosting the mids. Okay? So you're seeing that in this pattern. You see the, these different things. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing is it's boosting around, I can see that, 100, mm -hmm. 150, kind of sweeps down in the mids, and then it kind of has a little bit of a peak in the, in the highs, it looks like, a little okay. bit of dips. So you're going to see patterns that look kind of <coughs> funky when you're looking at microphones, right? So what you're looking at is a microphone that essentially enhances what you're trying to do. And this is just a real quick way of saying this, but if I have a, if I want to mic, if I want to, if I want to mic a flute, would I use the one that enhances low frequencies? No. Right. Go with the high frequency. Go with something that's maybe going to add a little bit of crispness to it, so it's less EQ. -ed. Let me tell you the perfect microphone. The perfect microphone. Where it doesn't boost anything. That's the perfect microphone. Does that exist? Nope. Okay. It doesn't. It doesn't. This is this is what people are spending ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for, these two microphones and all the stuff in the studios. I mean these things are no joke expensive. They're trying to get as close as they can to that line being straight. Because what are they trying to do in a studio or what are you trying to do in life? You're in sound reinforcement. Your, your description of your job isn't sound changing. It isn't sound forming. They're trying to reinforce what is what they are doing. If they're singing away, you want to sound just like them singing, just happens to be louder. So the ultimate holy grail is the flattest microphone you can possibly get. Does that exist in our world? No. So all we can do, see it. See it. So all we can do is try to get as close to that and. Um, you're not going to get that. You're going to you're going to have to deal with frequency response and figure out what matches your use the best. Okay. Um, if you go look at, go online and look for headphones tonight. All right. You go online and look for headphones. One of the things that you're on everything your every headphone you're looking at, you're going to find a frequency response chart. And what that it's going to look exactly like this. It's going to look exactly like that. Mm -hmm. And what that is saying is like, okay, so maybe I want something that's going to add some bass. Beats, beats for instance, look like this, okay? And they're swept here. They sweep out the mids. So they're, they're, um, they're acoustically tuned frequency response to the type of music that you like. That's why beats kind of hit the market like they did. That and Dr. Dre, I guess. But um, 
If you're kind of a jazz guy, you, you want to probably get something super flat. You know, you're looking at different frequency responses of headphones and you kind of know what you're going to get out of. Okay? Mm. It works the same way with microphones. Okay. What, are you going to, what are you going to get out of it, what you put in it? That's what frequency response tells you. Okay. Okay? All right, I'm going to jump on one more thing. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, without going too into depth. So any microphone that you're looking at, you can always dive in and you can look at the frequency response. Um, let me say this. Let me stop for a second. Anything that we talk about that you want to learn more about, act like you're going to buy it. So if you're at home and you're doing nothing and you're bored, it gets dark early right now, act like you're going to buy a microphone for something. Mm -hmm. Dig in. Look at the frequency response. Look at this. Look at the pattern. And, and you'll learn so much by doing that. So uh, if you get bored, do that. If you don't want to do it, I don't care. I'm just saying. I've always used that model that when I want to learn something about it, because I, now I feel like I'm spending my own Well, yeah, you, I, I, and I agree with that, because it's just like when I go into detail and stuff, I, you start digging I in. do my research. Mm -hmm. You start digging in. And in y'all's case, you can dig in and just learn more. It's going to help everything around here. Um, so why not? All right, here's the last thing I'll talk about today is proximity effect, okay? Proximity effect is huge on a microphone. What that is, and I, again, I can't demonstrate it. They will do it tomorrow, uh, next week. What that is is that it changes the way a microphone sounds by the distance that it is from okay. your mouth. So the rule is double the distance, half the volume. That's kind of the mathematical rule. So it's here, here, here. That's why when people move it away, you're chasing them, trying to run up the volume. That's not the biggest, that's, that's a big problem, don't get me wrong. But the biggest problem with, freak, with proximity effect is that when you have the mic in the proper location, you get all the bass response, you get all the fullness, you get the good sound. As soon as you move it here, thin, airy, uh, you, your whole frequency response changes. Now you're trying to re-EQ, you're trying to do different things to make it up artificially. So you always want to try to have the microphone as close as possible, okay? It's one of those things that everybody knows. But don't do. But as, as we continue to move forward in the class, I want you to be thinking a little bit more than the average guy. Everybody knows your microphone's going to sound better when it's closer to your mouth, when you use it properly, and it's going to be louder. What I want you to do is understand what's happening if it's not there and how to possibly fix it as an engineer on on the on the soundboard okay so <coughs> double the distance half the volume and when it, you it, it, the further distance you go that's simple dry cut further distance you go the thinner it sounds yeah. it's flat out it just starts sounding thin it's just the science of how microphones work it's with all microphones so condenser microphones are going to be more forgiving of that so you got a condenser microphone it's going to pull pull that microphone in closer naturally because of you know the electronic plate that's in it and keep that proximity effect at greater distances. Also, we'll do look at that next week, um, too, when we have that other mic. But proximity effect is a big deal. So uh, as we move forward with how to EQ and stuff like that, we'll, that will come into play a little bit on what that is. Because the only time I could ever see when I would pull the mic away is, like, say I went from a soft part to a song or just a steady part in a song, but then it comes in and I progress my voice so much that I'm trying to keep the same level as when I was here, yep. but with the different sound. And the only way I can get that sound out was to progress that much air out and then whatever I'm doing, my screaming, or am I just trying to, you know, pull off a heavy vocal for chorus or something right. like that? But that would be the only time I ever pulled apart. And realistically, I probably shouldn't have been doing that. No, no, yeah, no you should have. You should have. Yeah. Um, the, because, because you're giving it more, that's... That's, con that's called mic technique. Mm -hmm. Mic technique, if somebody knows how to do it, is perfectly fine. Um, the problem is when people don't know how to use it. Use it. Yeah. Like when right. we were in the church at Inspire on Sunday, sometimes, you know, when he would bring different people into the choir, and mm -hmm. some knew how, you know, to use the mic, and some just did. Had no idea. You know, you know and uh, that's, that's the reality of of uh, the business that we're in is is it's yeah. important to us but it's not to them and, right <laughs> and you know it's our job to to make it sound as good as we can so we use the knowledge that we have we try to get them to pull the mic closer there's some other tricks that you can do you know turning turning down the monitor which makes them have to pull it closer to hear themselves and and different things like that but 
you know, it, it is what it is. It, it, it's yeah. one of those things we just try to <laughs> do as yeah. we can. Um, there's more to microphones. Um, I usually spend a little bit more time on this, but a lot of it is stuff that y'all kind of already know, like the XLR cables and stuff like that. Um, wireless mics, y'all already know about them. Handheld wireless mics in a wireless format can also show up in condenser or uh, dynamic. All those different patterns can show up in a wireless microphone. So a lot of the high-end wireless microphones, you know, you can screw the head off. You can just buy different elements and it's different uh, pickup patterns, and different sensitivity and all that kind of stuff. That's why there's so many different heads that you can buy for them. Um, you know about bell packs, essentially, lapel mic, clip it on. I mean, I don't want to go too much in detail on that in headsets. So, any questions? Y'all know a little bit more about mics? Yeah. Okay, good. Then we did something. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, next week we'll go get the stuff. We'll bring it over and then we'll start off by playing with that pickup pattern so y'all can see that. And then we'll jump. Oh. We'll just jump right into the mixer. We're bringing all the stuff that we had in class. Let's just bring it all over here. At this okay, point, yeah. Need it yeah, that's okay. There. Yeah, okay. And we'll just put it somewhere in here. Okay. Cool? Cool.